All right, good morning, everybody. Let's get started. <clears throat> Thanks for coming to Grand Rounds. Uh, my name is Ben Chu. I've been on staff here for two years now. Uh, one of the endurologists, Dr. Goldenberg, told me to introduce myself as the, one of the chief residents. But uh, anyways, I've been on here for a couple of years. I'm going to report on the second international consultation of stone disease. The first one was done in 1997, where Joe Segura headed that up from Mayo Clinic. Then later on, that uh, gets basically uh, written up as the AUA guidelines. So this is also a, a big document. It's an uh, international panel on how to manage all aspects of stone disease. It's then published uh, as a big document from the World Health Organization and then condensed into the AUA guidelines and published in the Journal of Urology. And I was uh, asked to be one of the panel members. So we met in Paris, France in September 2007. This also coincided with the Society of International Urology meeting so we spent one day where we all got together and we presented uh, everything from the eight groups that were, that were formed. And I'm going to talk a bit about the highlights of that because that was about an eight or nine hour presentation. So I won't get to everything, but I want to present some of the highlights. Here are the eight section leaders and the various different things that we spoke about. Uh, epidemiology, economics, imaging, uh, management, and, and various other things. So I'll get to uh, a lot of this today and a lot of the really important stuff for urologists. And... Uh, Dr. Roger Sutton and I are planning on doing another Grand Rounds together where we're going to talk about uh, medical management in particular. All English works were looked at, peer-reviewed uh, data databases. We looked at abstracts as well as full-length papers. And we did it according uh, to the level one to level four evidence. Gary Kerhan's group looked at the epidemiology and economics of stone disease. And it's no surprise to this group that the prevalence of stone disease has increased over the last while, and there's been many reasons for that. This is uh, both in males. You can see that uh, over 1988 to 1994, the prevalence of stone disease has increased, as well as in females. In terms of in race, we see that there is definitely a, a bigger increase in the Caucasian population, but also in the African-American population. This has also started to increase, particularly in the later years. However, the prevalence in the uh, African-Americans are still much lower. Stone types are very, fairly similar. Calcium oxalate is still the most uh, prevalent type. And there's a mixture of everything else. And there's a bit more struvite stones found in females. And this, of course, is associated with uh, urinary tract infections. Risk factors. No surprise to everybody. Uh, different age groups. We find it's a bimodal distribution. Geography and warmer, hotter climates where people are more dehydrated. And also perhaps something to do with the water. Genetics does play a big role, and it's something that we did not get into, but uh, we found that there's probably about a 30% familial uh, association of stones. There's also a lot of, uh, a lot of evidence, too, uh, performing on single nucleotide polymorphisms on such genes as the SL626A6 gene, which looks at chloride transport. Other things are epidemia, uh, the epidemic of obesity, leading to more hypertension and diabetes, a lot of bowel disease, and as well as patients getting bowel bypass surgery as well. So this is all adding to the increased prevalence of uh, stone disease. <coughs> I'm going to go over the dietary risk factors. Animal protein, oxalate, and even glucose and fructose have also been shown to increase your risk for stone disease. Vitamin C, which is converted to oxalate in the body, also combines with calcium, and, and you get calcium oxalate stones. Decreased risk, we're going to talk about the calcium myth from yesteryear where people were told to avoid calcium altogether, and we know that's now not to, not to be true. Uh, phosphorus and phytate from certain uh, plants, as well as, of course, the old age standby fluid. The more fluid you drink, the less chance you have of getting stones. <coughs> now, this is a very large group from Gary Kerhan's uh, uh, group, and this is the seminal article from the England Journal of Medicine from 1993 showing that those patients who had a, a much lower intake of dietary calcium, less than 600 milligrams a day, actually had a much higher stone risk. And the reason for that is that because you have the oxalate ingestion, then you have unopposed oxalate ingestion. The oxalate gets absorbed and then will recombine with any kind of calcium inside the body. So if you, are, if you do take more dietary calcium, this will combine with the oxalate in your GI tract and get excreted in the feces rather than become absorbed <clears throat> to become a calcium oxalate stone. Excuse me. <coughs> oxalate intake, uh, for the highest quintiles, there was a moderate risk for increasing your risk of stone disease. It's definitely worse if you also have a low calcium intake because you don't have anything to combine with it in the GI tract. And these are three studies. The uh, health professional follow-up study, which consists of about 50,000 males 
these are all uh, male health professionals. There's actually no medical uh, doctors in there, but it's all uh, dentists, uh, 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 veterinarians, uh, podiatrists, uh, chiropractors kind of thing. The NHS is the Nursing Health Study 1 and 2. 1 is the uh, older population now, since it's been a longer follow-up, and 2 is the younger population. So we particularly see that if you're either a male or an older female, that you're more, li more likely to get a stone, and increased relative risk of about 1.2 if you eat a lot of oxalate. For younger women, it doesn't seem to make a big difference. Non-dietary risk factors particularly body mass index. Of course, this is a, a positive correlation in all of them. The, higher, the heavier you are, the higher your relative risk of getting stone disease. This is probably likely due to uh, diabetes as well as uh, things like hypertension, perhaps proteinuria, but definitely an epidemic. Gout. Gout increases your risk of nephrolithiasis by twofold. Uh, so cross-sectionally, what they did was they found the prevalence of all the people in the study who had gout and whether or not they had a stone. 46% and 50, 65% of females at that one time actually had a stone if they had gout. Prospectively, they, they followed people who developed gout and, and saw who had stones, and it was actually much higher. However, if you get stone disease, that doesn't mean you have an, an increased risk of gout. So if you get a uric acid stone, it doesn't mean you have an increased risk of gout. But having gout does increase your risk of getting stone disease. Diabetes, this is another big thing. Of course, the rate of diabetes is increasing vastly in North America. And it's very, uh, very uh, heavily linked to getting stones as well. In fact, the relative risk for older women and men is about 1.38 to 1.67 in younger women. And if you get a kidney stone, this is very interesting, if you get a kidney stone, you have an increased relative risk for developing diabetes later in life. So if you get a stone today and you're a young person, you actually have a 1.3 to 1.49 increased relative risk of having diabetes later. Now, this kind of ties into the data that came out of Mayo Clinic uh, about two, two years ago, where they looked at patients who had lithotripsy and followed them out, well, didn't follow them out, but retrospectively looked at them 19 years ago. If they had lithotripsy 19 years ago, they called them up and said, do you have diabetes? And they compared them to patients who did not have lithotripsy. Now, they did find that those who had lithotripsy had an increased risk of diabetes. They, they, they theorized that perhaps lithotripsy was causing that. <clears throat> However, most studies have actually refuted this. I think that their control group was really not uh, very, very sound. And the AUA current consensus is that shockwave lithotripsy is safe and does not cause diabetes. Uh, we, we, Chuck Zurwich, Robin, uh, Ryan Patterson, and Robin Mason, uh, one of the medical students, uh, looked at our data here. So we went back 20 years. We, contacted patients who had lithotripsy in 1985 to 1987, and it was, we had no control group, so we couldn't find out who had a stone in 1985 and 87 who didn't have lithotripsy, because I think everyone who had a stone in 1985 probably had lithotripsy, but I don't know, maybe Dr. Sullivan can, uh, can, uh, <coughs> can uh, correct me there. So re admittedly, we don't have a very good control group, so what we did was we compared it to the provincial average for the prevalence of diabetes for that age group. So in the blue is the BC population for prevalence of patients between 55 to 74. So males, it's about 10%. It's around 9 to 10%. And our study group who had lithotripsy for stones 20 years ago had a much higher rate of having diabetes. It was about a three to four-fold, and Dr. Afshar helped us with this as well, uh, but a three to four-fold uh, increased relative risk for having diabetes after having lithotripsy. So is this the... What came first, the chicken or the egg? My feeling is from reading the rest of the literature, and I think the consensus is that there is definitely an association. We don't know whether this is a causal link. We definitely think that, uh, uh, my personal bias is that I think that we're just finding these patients earlier who are, are developing a stone but have subclinical insulin resistance, i.e. diabetes, and then later on develop it. And that's what's been shown in these previous studies by Kerhan. Uh, interesting, Robin Mason uh, presented this at a all-medical student conference uh, for North America in Carmel in, in January, and this actually won an award uh, in the nephrology section. So let's look at urinary risk factors. We all know that the less you drink, the more concentrated your crystals are going to be. So cases are patients who had uh, uh, stones, and if you drank less on your 24-hour urines, then you obviously had a higher risk of getting stone disease versus controls who had no stones. Hypercalceria is the most common abnormal finding on 24-hour urines uh, in, in patients with stones, and this was no exception. Generally, once you get over 200 milligrams a day of calcium in the urine, you're starting to increase your relative risk of, of getting uh, uh, kidney stones, and this was found in all three studies. 24-hour urine oxalate, also the same thing. Uh, the more oxalate you have in your urine, the, increased, the more increased the relative risk. <clears throat> 
So to conclude in the epidemiology, we know that kidney stones are common, increasing in frequency. Dietary factors play a big role, as well as uh, systemic things. Um, traditional definitions need to be reassessed, and we really need sort of bigger studies to sort of see how uh, prevalent this is. Now, this was a very difficult task. Look at the economics of stone disease. Uh, I'll tell you why. We'll, we'll look at the direct cost of how much it costs the medical system exactly when patients get acutely ill, how much it costs to treat them and follow up. But then there's a huge indirect cost in terms of loss of productivity, wages, time spent with family, uh, caregiving, those types of things. And it was very difficult to do this in our international system because it was really variable depending on what type of healthcare system, what country you came from. We looked at the treatment-related uh, costs for acute episodes and any kind of follow-up activities and procedures. We looked at then prevention-related uh, costs. So we assumed that costs would be homogeneous across countries. We, knew, we found out that later this was certainly not true. The majority of the costs were due to the procedures. There was vast differences in, in costs between ESWL and ureteroscopy between countries, even medications. We all know that. I mean, here you need a, a prescription for, for things. You go down to Mexico and, and get Viagra over the counter. So, I mean, it's really different. Uh, there's regional differences even within countries seen. The last, any good data, that's solid data, comes from the U.S., and it's close to about $2 billion. This was from the year 2000. I think we can certainly say it's over $2 billion now. Most of the costs were, were due to inpatient costs as well as emergency room and some outpatient treatments. So we assume that equipment costs would, would not differ because the manufacturers are pretty much the same worldwide. But there was a real variability because some places didn't account for the capital costs of either the lithotripter or the ureteroscopes or the laser. Uh, physician fees varied widely from country to country and as well as hospital fees. So we really had a very hard time understanding the financial burden associated with stones and we, we really didn't get a very good sense of this. We just know that it costs, in the U.S., that's probably the, the best study there was, that it costs over $2 billion in, in, in per year. And we really needed a more standardized approach for cost assessment. There was another study done by Lotan and Peggy Pearl and Jeff Cadedu's group in uh, southwestern Texas, and they found that observation was the most cost-effective uh, uh, option for ureteral stones. And actually, I think we went over this article in, in, in Journal Club, actually. So it's the most cost-effective thing for ureteral stones is, is observation. Even if the stone is higher up and you have a higher chance of getting obstruction, you're still more, more cost-effective to go ahead and, and observe. Medications, however, such as alpha blockers, tamsulosin, uh, have been actually helped to increase the likelihood of stone uh, passage and also decrease the need for urologic intervention. And, of course, this is also very cost-effective as well. And there's overwhelming evidence that uh, alpha blockers will help pass stones. In terms of the indirect costs, we know that about up to a third of the patients, and I think this is probably a conservative estimate, have had to take time off work due to this condition, either for treatment, due to pain. We've all had patients who have a stent or have stones and just can't do their work. Uh, mean loss is about 19 hours per year. In terms of the cost, this is, uh, I found this a little surprising, but the shockwave lithotripsy was consistently higher uh, cost than, than ureteroscopy in most places. This also depends on where you had your shock with the tripster, whether it was in the operating room or somewhere else. And it depend, also depended, too, on, of course, on whether you put in the capital cost of the lithotriptor. Lotan did say that uh, uh, he thought that ureteroscopy is a better choice than shock with lithotripsy, uh, as well as because it's cheaper and also because it has a higher success rate. So in conclusion for the economic part of stone disease, we know it costs a lot. Very complex, difficult to assess the entire international uh, impact that it has. We need to really standardize the approach. This was the panel that I was involved in, and uh, Dina Simos from uh, Wake Forest was our uh, chairman. So basically, everyone should have a history and physical done in all cases. That was a kind of a no-brainer. Dietary history should be elicited. We should also look at family history, given that there is a very uh, heavily familial uh, component to stone disease. We should also ask about stone-inducing drugs. Everyone should get blood work, including electrolytes, creatinine, calcium, glucose, serum uric acid, and phosphorus. And if you suspect any kind of uh, sepsis or infection, everyone should get a CBC and a blood culture as well. Now, stone analysis is really important, and I can't stress this enough, and it should be obtained for first-time and recurrent stone formers. Even if you know what a person's stone was in the past, it may not be what they are producing now. And I'll talk a little bit about how calcium oxalate stone formers end up being calcium phosphate stone formers at a later date. But this stone analysis actually directs your further testing. Uh, 
most common techniques are uh, infrared spectroscopy. So you basically grind it up, you get like a little spectrum, and then you match it up to a library. That's the technique our hospital uses. Other things like XRD or X-ray diffraction crystallography are also used and very accurate. Now, if you do get uric acid, cysteine, or calcium phosphate stones, these are predictive of associated medical conditions. So uric acid, either diabetes, gout, uh, cysteine stones, obviously cysteine urea, genetic defect. Calcium phosphate uh, could be a sign of distal uh, RTA. Now, the trend of conversion of ox calcium oxalate to calcium phosphate stones has been shown uh, by, by Jim Lingaman's group in Indianapolis. If you get a, da if you get a damaged epithelium or damaged uh, tubule, what can happen is that the calcium phosphate crystals will actually form the nidus of that stone, and eventually these patients will just form, instead of calcium oxalate stones, calcium uh, uh, phosphate and brushite stones, which are much harder to fragment. People get this either from getting lasered there or uh, even shockwave lithotripsy. And this has been shown that even a lot of the uh, calcium oxalate stones that we see, if you believe Jim Lingaman's group and his data, is that it's, the middle of it is actually a calcium phosphate uh, nidus. Non-contrast CT is the imaging modality of choice. And it also may help predict the results of shockwave lithotripsy. There's actually been quite a few studies retrospectively looking at the number of Hounsfield units. Stones that have Hounsfield units greater than 900 to 1,000 are much less likely to fragment under the shockwave lithotripter. Fragments that are less than 900 Hounsfield units have a much better chance and fragmented much better using shockwave lithotripsy. So we can't predict results using the Hounsfield units. It's probably something we should do a little more often, and, and we, don't, we don't do that here. Indeed, non-contrast CT may also even help identify those with uric acid stones. Now, this is uh, also not used as well, but um, there is some literature suggesting that if you have a Hounsfield unit between 350 to 500, that perhaps that's more in keeping with a uric acid stone. Uh, this is not completely specific, but uh, certainly could help you make a decision on whether or not you can try some alkalinization first. Now, the only other method is a new type of uh, scanner, and we actually have one of these at VGH in the eMERGE department. Uh, Dr. Um, Nikolaou, Dr. Zerwich, uh, Patterson, and I are doing, uh, help doing a study here on this dual energy CT scanner. So instead of having one energy source, there's actually two. And you have one given at um, 80, uh, 80 kBs and the other at 140 kBs. You, take the, you acquire these images simultaneously. And what you're able to do is uh, form out a map of where the uric acid, cysteine stones, and uh, calcium phosphate stones are. We can actually alter the, the viewing software on our PAC systems so that anything below this line will look blue and anything above it will look red. So if you want to look and see if this is a uric acid stone, or uh, excuse me, a calcium oxalate stone, anything blue, such as the uh, calcium inside the bones, then you see basically a, a, a blue stone. If it alters it and you see a red stone, it's uric acid. Now, we're also, what we did was we took stones out of patients getting percutaneous nephrolithotomy. The residents know this because you're involved in this. Then what we do is um, we take the stone and also scan it, and then we get uh, infrared spectroscopy to, to, to actually confirm what the stone is. So we're actually developing also algorithms for the cysteine stones as well as the calcium phosphate stones. And this has proven to be quite, uh, quite sensitive and quite specific. And we've altered the protocol so that uh, even though that there's two energy sources, the amount of radiation given is exactly the same as you would get in a non-contrast CT from a single source. So look for this to come, and I think this will be the wave of the future. So non-contrast CT should be obtained in pre-surgical planning, particularly looking at adjacent structures before doing things as, such as a percutaneous nephrolithotomy. It's very good for looking at stone volume and orientation of the stone within the kidney. We don't do this very often, but giving intravenous contrast will also help you delineate the anatomy. Uh, I think earlier on in the 90s, perhaps, I think every patient uh, got an IVP to tell us what the anatomy was. So we know that uh, a plain KUB is superior to that dinky little scout you get on the, on the, on the, on the, on the CT scans, you know, that grainy thing you get at the beginning, so don't use that. If you really want to get a KUB, just get a KUB. Now, the one thing that, that is not as sensitive with the non-contrast CT is the craniocaudal dimension, so the, the head-to-toe head to distance. Remember, we're usually taking five-millimeter slices, so if it makes it into two slices, we will, we'll just say, well, it's visible in two slices. We think it's a centimeter. But it could be six centimeters, and it, it just makes it into that second slice, and we think that it's a centimeter. So it's not very accurate for determining that, and a KUB X-ray was more accurate for determining craniocaudal dimensions. Some, uh, some other policy statements for follow-up. So if you're a first-time stone former and you're stone-free, you don't have any other systemic disorder, follow-up imaging is not recommended. This is if you're a first-time stone former. 
But however, if you're watching or observing small fragments, if you're surveilling them, then if they're looking for asymptomatic radio opaque stones, an annual plain KUB should be obtained. And typically what I do is I usually do this every six months for the first year, just to make sure that uh, the stone isn't getting bigger at a really rapid rate. And once I'm satisfied with that, I think an annual KUB is, 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 will suffice. And of course, uh, the caveat to that is the patient should all know that if they get into trouble with pain, they need to call, come back earlier, we get them on the lithotripter or, in, or into your ureteroscopy. Now, what about recurrent stone formers who are treated and then pass their stones? If you know that someone has re re recurred and, and formed a stone, say, more than twice, uh, uh, particularly over three times, these patients should really get an annual uh, KUB x-ray if they have radiopaque stones. If they don't, then an, an ultrasound would suffice. But I either recommend the family doctor to go ahead and do this, or I have them come back and see me once a year to make sure that they're not forming any new stones. Urine evaluation. Urine analysis, obviously, should, should be performed on all patients. If you're suspecting sepsis, a urine culture, in addition to the uh, blood culture that we talked about earlier, should also be performed. Now, 24-hour urine testing is not recommended for everybody, but anyone with recurrent stone formers, and by this the definition would mean any, basically your second stone and above, so you don't need to do it for first-time stone formers. Cysteine, cysteine stones, obviously. Um, any, anyone with children, or sorry, any children or those with a solitary kidney because they have so much at stake because they only have the one kidney, you need to really get on these patients to figure out why they're forming stones. Anyone with renal insufficiency, uh, patients with multiple stones, calcium phosphate stones would be another one that I didn't add in here, and any individuals with bowel disease. You also have to look at their occupation. Anyone with public safety in, in, at hand has to be evaluated and as well as stone-free before returning to work, such as airline pilots, uh, police officers, etc. So uh, take into account what their occupation is, and uh, the, the more serious their occupation is, the more you should get on these patients. We all agreed that urine has to be collected while the patient's consuming a random diet and consuming the normal amount of fluid that they do. Dr. Sutton knows too well that this is very difficult to do because patients have that metabolic stone clinic effect. By the sheer effect of studying it, things change. Because you know you're collecting urine for 24 hours, you're going to drink more, uh, you're going to try to eat better, do, do various things. Dennis Hosking from Winnipeg actually tells his patients nothing about changing their diet or even changing their fluids until he gets their 24-hour urine. And I think this is a very good practice, but often difficult to do because the patients are just hounding you for more information. So the, the, the recommendations of the panel guideline is actually to choose uh, what to order depending on your stone analysis. I think Dr. Patterson, Sutton, and I uh, basically just run the full gamut on everything uh, um, just to, to make sure we cover all of our bases. Recommend two 24-hour urine uh, collections just to make sure that uh, one abnormal uh, value is not aberrant. Generally, one day on the weekend because it's easier to collect urine when you're home on the weekend and one day during the week as well. And you don't need calcium load testing in all patients with hypercalcemia. So everyone should have serum calcium, calcium done. That's basically your screening for hyperparathyroidism. If it's high, obviously, get a serum parathyroid hormone level. The reason why we don't do that in all patients is because of the cost of, of, of this test. We also should or, uh, order this, though, however, in patients who are recurrent stone formers who have a high normal serum calcium. Serum calcium is extremely, exquisitely um, uh, tightly adjusted. I mean, if the upper level is 2.55, 2.56 is a really abnormal value. There's no question. 2.55 is probably an abnormal value. So really, if you have a recurrent stone form with a high serum calcium, go ahead and get a serum parathyroid hormone. I have seen people um, with uh, hyperparathyroidism with a high, serum normal, uh, high normal serum calcium level. Now, what do you do if you do find a, a hyperparathyroidism? You should go on to get a persantine study to see uh, if, if the glands are indeed uh, overproducing. And these patients should uh, undoubtedly, level one evidence, undergo a, a parathyroidectomy. Now, these patients automatically assume that, oh, great, I'm totally free now and I will be free of stones. That is not true. They actually reduce their risk almost to the level of the general population. So these patients need to know, because uh, when they come back and they have stones and they weren't told this beforehand, they're really disappointed. They have to know that they still have a risk for stone disease, and it's uh, still at least the same as the general population, and probably, in my opinion, a little bit greater. So in conclusion for this uh, segment, evaluation of the stone former is an important uh, task. Many, uh, many steps are, don't have the, the great kind of evidence, but really based on consensus. 
So medical management was managed by uh, Peggy Pearl and her group. I'm not going to talk very much about this because I want Dr. Sutton and I to present on this at a later date, and this is a, a whole new round on itself. I will just say a few things about the conclusions is that if, if nothing else, more fluid is better, lower the sodium and the animal protein, um, even though the direct level one evidence is lacking, but decreasing dietary sodium and animal protein is going to help. Decreasing the animal protein will decrease the amount of uh, urea, uric acid in the urine, and heterogeneous nucleation. Dietary calcium was a bit controversial, but really we know that you should not be restricting uh, dietary calcium for the reasons that we talked about to have unopposed oxalate absorption. Drug therapy should be instituted when appropriate. Thiazides have been shown to help, uh, as well as allopurinol. Even if you have a calcium stone, but you have hyperuricosuria, allopurinol is going to help. Again, that heterogeneous nucleation. So this is, uh, let's get on to the interesting stuff from uh, Jim Lingaman's group. Darren Biko from Canada also helped out with this. Uh, he's from uh, Queen's University. And Manoj Manga is actually another Canadian, but he's actually working at the University of Minnesota now and uh, is a big guru in endoneurology. So we all know about the HM3, which we had here at UBC, uh, in, the, in the water bath. Now, this lithotripsy is a bit different from other technologies. Normally, when you have a first generation of something, it's usually your worst one. As the generations develop, the lithotriptors get better and better. Lithotripsy is a bit different. Our best lithotriptor was our first lithotriptor. All subsequent lithotriptors have not had the same kind of success rates. We think that we'll go over part of the reasons why, but certainly the, the newer ones that we have are higher retreatment rates, and they have a much more narrow focal zone. And instead of using water to couple, because sound waves travel so well through water, uh, we were using gel to apply to the shock head. Now, through the water bath, this was uh, a bit of a pain. The water had to be drained in between patients for obvious reasons. A general anesthetic as, as was necessary as well. Whereas opposed to today, they can be under IV sedation. And we even have patients who, who go under it with no sedation at all. So when looking at the mechanisms with stone fracture, you send in the shock wave, which then uh, results in a compression and a tensile force on the stone. The tensile force then rebounds back. You're getting cavitation bubbles. As those uh, collapse, you're starting to get uh, distal spallation. The stone will start to fragment. So how can we maximize stone fragmentation but minimize trauma to the tissue surrounding the stone? What we need to do is we actually need to increase the technology and improve that as well as our technique with what we currently have to increase the uh, outcomes. So different uh, focal zones. So the HM3 and the litho diamond up top, this, this purple zone here recommends the focal zones. Wider focal zone means that the shock blast path was going in a wider area. Uh, the, the Stortz SLX, which is one of the newer lithotriptors, has a very narrow focal zone of only four millimeters. Now look at the Look at the, 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 the waveforms on the left. They look fairly similar. Look at the numbers, though. The high peak pressures of the HM3 and the litho diamond were maybe in the high 20s, uh, low 30 me megapascals. Look at the Stortz SLX. It's over 60. So this has a peak pressure that is twice as much in a very little focal zone. I liken this to, for HM3, a very wide focal zone. This is kind of like getting spanked with a ping pong paddle. Uh, because it's very wide, and then a Stortz XLX is getting hit twice as hard in a, very li in a very smaller zone. It's almost like getting hit with a missile or a bullet versus a ping pong paddle. So what about the difference though? When you actually take a stone and you don't have a very narrow focus, the outer part of the stone is likely going to get less tension or less um, uh, compressive forces. When you get a wider uh, focal zone, then what's going to happen is that the shock wave is going to reach the outer parts, produce a higher tension, and produce better fragmentation. So this is one of the theories is why the HM3 was better, because you have a wider focal zone at lower peak pressures. What about respiration? You know, all these things we do in vitro are all on stones sitting right at, 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 the, at F2, but uh, patients breathe and the kidney moves. So uh, a, cle a clever group uh, by uh, Dick Babayan's group um, made this apparatus which actually moves the stone at, and you can vary the motion between 10 to 48 millimeters and then we can use it on shock or lithotriptors to get a better idea of how the rate of respiration actually helps. So the first thing they did was they looked at uh, rate and we've all been talking about this, this is a hot topic, 60 versus 120 shocks a minute. Even standing still at, level z at, at zero motion, lower rate was actually better. So this is the way to retain fragments so a lower number is better. Um, the 60 shockwaves a minute was actually better than 120. As you move beyond 10 millimeters uh, of motion, then it actually gets much worse if you go to 120 shocks a minute. And they uh, reckon that basically once you go over 10 to 20 millimeters of motion of res respiration, 
more than two-thirds of your shocks are actually not even hitting the stones. So that's one, one of the reasons. But also, even if you don't move it, we can show here that 60 shocks a minute is much uh, far superior. So what about focal width? The Stortz XLX has that really narrow focal width of four millimeters. Look, so lower is worse now. Than, okay, so as the motion gets higher, their fragmentation rate is much lower. In fact, when it gets to be quite res respiratory, it doesn't, even sh it doesn't even fragment these stones at all. How about the wide focal zone with the litho diamond? A much steadier plateau. It did go down with brigadier respiration, but much less. And this is because it had a much wider focal zone where the, it's able to capture that kidney that's still moving around. Now, the newest version of this, which is the SLX F2, and this is the version that they have in Toronto, and has recently been bought in uh, London, Ontario, and I think as well as in Newfoundland or Halifax. No, I can't remember. Newfoundland or Halifax. So this is sort of seems to be the newest one, and I think we're also looking at this one as well. Uh, you're actually able to adjust your focal zone. You can make it very pinpoint for your redrill stones, because they don't move around very much, or make it very wide, depending on whether the stone is in the kidney and whether the patients are, are heavy breathers or not. Jim Lingeman's uh, group is really that uh, his feeling is that this, these newer technologies are too powerful at too narrow focal zone and are probably too dangerous for their own good. Now, what about anesthesia? <clears throat> IV sedation is what we use because it's much easier, but you get much more respiration with, uh, under IV sedation versus general anesthetic. And time after time, these groups that study prospectively whether the patients had general anesthetic or not versus IV sedation, general anesthesia always wins out. And that's, I think, solely due to the respiratory movements. You're just keeping the patient much more still. Respiratory movements are controlled. And again, shown in this study here, was 87 versus 55% stone-free. <coughs> so our, our main goal is really uh, to help improve fragmentation rate and, and, and improve our technique that we have with our current technology. So what can we learn to do with the current things that we do have? Well, we can talk about coupling. We talked about the water versus the gel. Rate seems to be a big thing. We know that general anesthetic is better than a spinal anesthetic, and I'm going to talk about a protection protocol. So coupling, gel. So in, in, instead of having the water, like the HM3, transmit the shockwaves, which was an excellent transmitter of, of acoustic shockwaves, we now put water inside the shock head and then apply gel to apply up to the side of the patient. So normally if you take it out of the sort of little ultrasound bottles and squeeze it on and smear it around with your hand, you're going to get a lot of air pockets like you see down below here. And of course air pockets are killers of acoustic sound waves, so then you're going to see a lot of diminution of the shock wave. This is a special kind of gel that's applied in a much larger fashion, so you don't use your hand to smear it, you basically use a larger amount, and uh, this is also specially degassed gel as well. You can see less defects. In vitro, what does that do? Well, when we take stones in vitro and you have less air bubbles on the left, you get 100% fragmentation almost. When you have many more air pockets, even up to 18%, you're going to get much less fragmentation. And this is solely due to actually attenuating the shock waves that go through. The second thing you can do is you can blow up the balloon more. You know, we have a certain amount of water, and you can actually blow it up more. So this is the same, the same patient here. We've got this about 18% defects before we inflate the shock head a bit more with some more fluid. Once you inflate it, it actually goes down to much less. So make sure to keep that seal tight, inflate it well, and don't smear the gel around, and preferably use degassed gel. What about the rate? We've been going at 120 per minute just because this has been the norm forever. This has been challenged a few years ago, and uh, this is uh, work done by our own Dr. Ryan Patterson looking at uh, bagel stones, in, which are uh, standardized uh, fake stones, in both a pig as well as just in vitro in a stone bath, looking at uh, 30 shock waves a minute versus 120, 30 wins out invariably. You, I mean, you, why would you even do someone at 120 if you can see this kind of data? Of course, time is one issue. But certainly, the slower shock waves ha has been uh, uh, shown to be much more effective. There was a very, randomized, a very good randomized clinical trial done by Ken Pace. Uh, I took part in this. Uh, this was a, a multi-center study between um, uh, Toronto and London, and I took part in this as well. We looked at 60 versus 120 shock waves. Everyone was the same. The stone sizes were the same. We assessed fragments. We used less than 5 millimeter as success because that was the most common uh, finding or the most common definition of success in the, in the literature. 
And look at the differences here. <clears throat> the p-values were greatly significant in terms of 60 being much better. The su success was 0 0.02, uh, uh, p-value 0 0.02 was much better with 60 versus 120, particularly when the stones were greater than a centimeter. If the, greater, if the stones are greater than a centimeter, a slower shock wave is much better. Uh, le had less procedures at the end of three months, and you actually had to give less shocks until the stone broke. Unfortunately, the treatment time took longer. And here I'm finding that actually um, I'm going at about 90. First of all, our machine can't go at 60, but I'm going at around 90, and I think uh, Ryan's going around 70. And this has actually been shown to, I think, anecdotally, we haven't looked at our numbers, but anecdotally, I think the stones are breaking much better. They're literally breaking before our eyes versus the 120. And Dr. Niger is also using this as well. So this high-pressure, tight focus really are not doing us any good. Uh, decreased efficacy. These stones are moving targets, and these higher energy levels really are, are uh, causing a lot of renal trauma. So uh, as, as this group th thinks, you know, this lithotriptors really are probably too powerful for their own good. So don't use the highest power levels in the kidney. Okay, pre-treating them. So if you give uh, the first 500 shocks at a lower rate, this has been shown in animal studies to actually cause less tissue damage to the kidney. So don't just ramp up to level 5 or to level 4 uh, immediately on our electromagnetic lithotripter. The, the thing is, if you actually go at a slower rate or for the first 500 shocks treated at very low intensity, the theory is, is that it causes vasoconstriction inside of the kidney because you get that little tapping. It's saying, hey, we're coming, and the vessels of vasoconstrict, constrict, and then you get less cavitation bubbles and less damage subsequently after that. If you just go full bore uh, afterwards, you see a much larger, even visible hematoma, as well as a, a histological hematoma. See all this red area versus this one little area uh, pinpoint on the arrow on, on, on the upper kidney. <clears throat> so we know the general anesthetic will give us a, a better result and slowing the rate to at least uh, 90 to 60 is also going to help as well, and I think is going to become the new standard. Okay, so let's just keep going here. So we looked at the different types of lithotriptors. Um, we went through the kind you can use for rigid, which is for percutaneous nephrolithotomies, for all the flexible ureteroscopies. Um, we have the... Uh, Ultrasonic lithotriptor, which is basically our workhorse here. There's a combination one where you actually have an ultrasonic lithotriptor, and through the middle of it actually goes a pneumatic lithoclast. So you actually can do both things at once or just one or the other. So you can actually grind the stone into bits as well as hit it with the, with the pneumatic and uh, help, help fragment the stone. This is shown to be very quick, but a bit cumbersome. This handle is a bit large. <coughs> The new kit on the block is made by Laryngeal Mask Airway. These are the same guys who make the uh, LMA airways. Um, this is a handheld pneumatic lithotriptor using CO2 cartridges, just, just like you do for a pellet gun. Uh, we're in, involved in a trial right now. We're heading up this national trial of this versus just a pneumatic lithoclast. And just speaking with the residents who've used it, um, they, they think this is really good for the harder stones particularly. You could, it's great to break it up, then you can pluck out the pieces a lot faster actually than using the um, ultrasonic lithotriptor. Why is there a picture of the Mars rover? Well, when this Mars rover went to Mars, it actually had to open up rock samples to determine what was on the inside of them. And the technology that was used to fragment those stones has now been applied to medical technology. They, they were bought up by Gyrus ACMI, and this has now become the cyber wand. There's uh, an inner and an outer probe, and the outer probe basically floats. It vibrates at 21,000 hertz. And to me, you can basically think of this as an ultrasonic LUS-2 on steroids. It works twice as fast, um, but is probably about three to four times as loud. It's about 93 decibels, um, and an airplane taking off is like 110 or something. So, I mean, it, this thing is very loud if you've heard it in the OR, but it works very effectively. Let's talk about uh, what you can use on the inside. EHL has a much higher risk of perforation compared to any other type of uh, intracorporeal lithotripsy. The reason why is because you're basically putting in a little uh, spark plug into the ureter or the kidney, and the force radiates two centimeters out in every direction, whereas the homeum laser <coughs> gets absorbed within fluid within 0.5 millimeters. The homeum laser, however, uh, is the, by far the best when you're looking at fragmentation rates. We'll just skip through this here. And it also has other uh, applications where you can use it on tissue as well as strictures and for uh, resecting prostates or enucleating them. So we're getting down to the end here. Um, we're looking at um, Jean de la, Jean de la Rosette's uh, group looked at the treatment of renal stones. <clears throat> 
sec here. Jason, this okay. I got it. It's okay. Thanks. Thank, I got it. It was something popping up here. So you know we've gone so, we've gone pretty far from six people holding someone down and making a, a, a perineal incision to get all bladder stones and hoping that he survives uh, with a 50% mortality from infection in the 1800s um, to doing the first percutaneous nephrolithotomy in 1976, and then of course uh, the, uh, the advent of lithotripsy in the 80s to now very small, flexible ureteroscopes first developed uh, and, and, then, and really revolutionized in the 90s. We have lots of options when we t we're talking about renal stones. And this is the nitty-gritty stuff now. So basically, if you have a staghorn calculus, this should be treated. You can only observe them if they're unfit for, if their patients are unfit for intervention, very comorbid, uh, very elderly. But anyone with a good functioning kidney and a staghorn should be treated, and this is usually a percutaneous nephrolithotomy. Asymptoma asymptomatic small renal stones should be followed. Now, notice that we're just saying small renal stones. There's no size attached to this, but anything asymptomatic and small should really just be followed for the possibility of disease progression. Again, this is that yearly KUB x-ray we talked about. A CIRF is a clinically insignificant residual fragment. Is, uh, a treatment for this is not recommended, particularly if they're asymptomatic, hence the word clinically insignificant. Some of these will pass. Uh, some of them will not require treatment, even after just seeing a, a, an annual KOB on them. However, if you are going to treat those, and they do need treatment, then ESWL is the first choice for that. Now you see a level 3 recommendation <clears throat> that, uh, with a size attached to it. Fragments greater than 4 to 5 millimeters do have a risk to become symptomatic, have a greater risk than if it's less than 3 millimeters, basically. So is it, it's a bit of a gray zone. If it's asymptomatic, I think... I've been tending to leave these. You can argue that you should go ahead and, 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 and treat these. I do, particularly if people do a lot of traveling, if they live in a remote area, or if they have other comorbidities such as diabetes or have other problems that so can get them into trouble. But I think this is a bit of a grayer area here. Uh, the use of CT is more sensitive for detecting and measuring uh, stones. The lower pole anatomy, we all know, is a, is a big problem. We can fragment lower pole stones with shockwave, but they may not clear all the time, particularly for angle is less than 70 degrees, and if it's a long, narrow infundibulum, as you see on the right. If it's a shorter infundibulum that's more of a, of a, of a, of a less acute angle, then you're able to actually uh, pass these stones better. So here's the one thing. If you take nothing else away, if you have a stone up to one centimeter anywhere in the kidneys, ESWL is your first line treatment for radiopaque stones, one centimeter and, uh, and, and below ESWL. A stent, if the stone is less than two centimeters, does not decrease the rate of, stone, uh, of, of complications or increase the stone free rate. <clears throat> Their third uh, policy, which I don't typically uh, actually totally agree with, and I think uh, Ryan would agree with me, ureteral stenting should, should be considered for renal stones greater than two centimeters if you're doing ESWL really shouldn't be doing ESWL on stones greater than two centimeters. That, that's, that's why I think this is sort of a, a non-starter there. So if we're talking about larger stones which are greater than two centimeters, um, basically, uh, if you're, you're going to read all this, 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 uh, this policy statement here, if, if you have a stone in the kidney that's greater than two centimeters, a PCNL is going to give you the best stone-free rate and best success rate by far. Greater than two centimeters, do PCNL. Now, it gets a little bit different when you go to the lower pole. You can still shock them, but they're not going to pass those fragments. Anything greater than a centimeter are best managed by PCNL. And diverticula should be managed by PCNL. And you can really do PCNL in transplant kidneys, ectopic kidneys. <clears throat> Ureteroscopy. Uh, it's a high success rate for stones in the kidney, which are less than one centimeter. And it's a preferred uh, choice if you have a bleeding diathesis and you can use a 200 micron laser fiber or EHL probes, which are small and flexible. Ureteral access sheets, they were pretty ambivalent on. They didn't have any, any uh, um, pro, uh, for or against, but basically it depends on the surgeon's preference and experience. If you are going to basket, it is much better to use one because that way you can put your ureteroscope in much more easily. Laparoscopy is feasible, but really very uh, rarely indicated in this present era with our very small uh, ureteroscopes. You can do laparoscopic nephrolithotomy or a partial nephrectomy for patients who have an anterior calocele diverticulum or if uh, flexible ureteroscopy has failed in that diverticulum. So very, very few uh, indications for laparoscopic stone removals. There was a bunch of other situations which I did not cover um, in terms of the anatomy, looking at bladder stones, 
pediatrics, uh, pregnancy. Uh, perhaps I'll cover these when Dr. Sutton and I do our other metabolic stone rounds. So thank you for your attention and open up the floor to any questions.